Good Mental Health, a regular podcast series that's designed to help you live a more fulfilling life. We do this by examining the tweets of Dr. Neil Marinello. He's a behavior expert and a solutions-focused life coach in Woodstock, Vermont. He's been exploring the human condition for over six decades, and we're pleased to have the good doctor on our podcast. As always, Neil, a pleasure having you on the show. My pleasure also, Matt. Uh, the focus for today's show is to more or less wrap up uh, our series, Good Mental Health. We began uh, this episode, if you will, this series, um, sort of with the 10 rules for life. It sort of morphed into that, if you will, uh, examining the tweets of Dr. Neil Marinello. Uh, we took a little bit of a break, did a recap. Um, uh, a number of uh, episodes followed, which to me were... Um, really talking about how the way that you perceive something influences the way that you think about it, which then determines the outcome and the world around you. And we wrapped up our series with what I thought was uh, really apropos uh, was your tweet that talked about the meaning of life is exactly what you deem it to be. And that um, basically is that you know, these soothsayers and these sages through the dawn of time, none of them have any answer to that question any more than anybody else does. And so what it comes down to is you uh, decide what the meaning of your life is. Dr. Neil, a pleasure. Uh, let's wrap up the series and, and share your thoughts with um, how this uh, podcast series evolved and what it became and some questions that uh, were brought to your attention from some of our viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, uh, the gap in time from our last podcast to now uh, was filled with some interesting feedback, which I received, <clears throat> most of which was focused on uh, the extent to which uh, uh, you had a chance to work through your issues about your suicide attempt. And, uh, uh, and I wanted to take some time for just you and I to talk, which we've done a few times since then, uh, so that you could uh, uh, have private sessions to decide what you wanted to share with the world uh, uh, about that and, and resolve the issue yourself. Uh, with regard to the, the meaning of life issue, uh, the anecdote which comes to mind is the one that, uh, uh, that happened with my, uh, my younger son, Kyle who uh, got basically a, uh, uh, a free scholarship to, um, uh, to Emory College, which is often called the Harvard of the South. Uh, and uh, uh, his first couple of years, he uh, took a lot of religion courses. And uh, uh, as the, the son of a, uh, an Italian Catholic and a, uh, a Brooklyn Jew, um, uh, I have always had to deal with the difficulty of different religions and the fact that I was kind of the person who, uh, uh, everybody wanted to see the first grandchild, first male grandchild, and I was that. So I sort of came into the world uh, with a mission uh, to bring these people together. Uh, but I had very little to do with religion myself. Uh, my daughter described me as a Buddhist uh, because I meditate a lot, but mm. I'm not sure that qualifies either. But I remember asking my son, uh, uh, what, uh, what did you learn with all that uh, stuff that you, all those religion courses that you took? You know, I was happy he got all A's on them, but it still seemed a little weird to me. And he said, well, dad, I guess it took me a little while to figure out that uh, nobody knows any better than I do what happens after you die. Mm. So the meaning of life and the concept of the meaning of life kind of uh, started with that, that idea. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing that I think that our viewers would both like to hear, though, is uh, what your perception is of uh, uh, what actually happened during your suicide attempt, both to you and your father, and what your perceptions are after that, because that has given some meaning to your life. Well, you know, I certainly look back at that time and I you know, and you and I have spoken at length about it, of course, and certainly on this podcast series as well, that, you know, I was going through probably one of the most difficult uh, times of my life. I personally, having spoken with an astrologer, ascribe it 
to an astrological transit. Now, I know that you have some problems with that, but that's how I've been able to compartmentalize it, if I will, and put it into a, a, a context that is something I can move beyond. Yeah, I and have no so problem with, uh, with, a, uh, with a, uh, the power of a belief system. Whether I agree with it or not isn't the issue. The issue is, uh, does it in fact help a person to grow or shrivel? Right. Yeah. And his advice helped me put this into a context so that I could examine it with you and with others in a more dispassionate uh, analysis. And so, again, I was going through what I call the tunnel of darkness. Um, and that what I think when you're in that period, you, you become very myopic. Again, you're in a tunnel of darkness. So this peripheral vision is gone and you're very, very focused on one thing. And so you can't see a lot outside of it. And so being in that tunnel of darkness, it took me to this place where, again, I was focused on um, not being a burden, not wanting to be a burden to people. Um, and when the event itself occurred, there was a time distortion in my mind and in yes. my brain. Yeah. Um, it was and, a, uh, and I look at it today and I still, I still see that time distortion and how, when you were, uh, when you were a teenager. Right, exactly. And again, you know, you and I have talked about how the lighting that night even was completely different. So I was in a in a very different time awareness uh, at that time, because again, I was in the tunnel of darkness. Um, and when you and I have spoken again at length about it afterwards, again, there was this there was this time distortion that went on. And in a way, you know, I looked you at and it. Your father, it sounds like. I'm sorry? For both you and your father. Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm, I, I'm trying to get to is that as much as there was a time distortion for me, um, my father was strangely roped into it as well. Um, <laughs> and it was sort of reliving a traumatic, period between him and I in my life that happened at uh, the age of 17. And it was like literally recreating it. And yeah. so what, what's so what he, uh, he really uh, blew up at you. Uh, right. A 17 year old who came home late, late. From, uh, from being out yep. and he waited for you. Yeah. And in his mind, it sounded like he was feeling like if he didn't really come down on you when you were in your 50s for staying out late, <laughs> yeah, that uh, he would be a coward like he had been when he ran away from the, from the guns. Mm. And so what's so interesting is, you know, through the work that you and I have done to be able to reframe that event. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so interesting to think that, you know, when that incident occurred at 17, the way that it transpired would sort of set up the incident, you know, 35 years later to actually be recreated to have a better ending to it, to have a better outcome, if you will. So for as an example, you know, the incident that happened at 17 between my, my father and I was a seminal event that was a separation for us. As a matter of fact, the day after that, you know, he and uh, my mother uh, separated and, yeah. you know, eventually divorced and he moved out of the house, you know, that day afterwards. So 35 years later to actually have that same event uh, recreated gave both of us an opportunity to have a better outcome. And I can tell this to the listeners that mm -hmm. For the five years after my incident, this occurred in July of 2014, my father passed in July of 2019, 
almost five years to the date of that incident. It was just one week uh, shy of the fifth year anniversary. And in that five years, my father and I worked so hard and consistently to be in each other's lives in a positive way and to show each other and to demonstrate to each other that we loved each other deeply. And mm -hmm. I know that when my father died, he knew that I loved him. And he he knew, knew that yeah. I knew that he loved me. Yes. So he was able to die knowing that I loved him. And both and, of you knew that you were not cowards. Exactly. That, and believe me, those five years were not, you know, oh, tulips and daffodils. There were some trying times where, again, we tested each other and each of us found the line uh, mm -hmm. as to where we could cross with each other. But I am so fortunate to have gone through that incident to be able to have had those last five years with him to rebuild and let him know that I I do love him and I know that he loved me. Yes. And, uh, and part of that fortune is the fact that you survived the most serious suicide attempt a person can have and still survive. Uh, that survival resulted in a complete change in your perception of, uh, uh, of what happened when you were 17 and what actually happened when you were in your 50s. Uh, instead of it's being a recreation, it was an opportunity for uh, a reframing. I think that was the word that you used yeah. of, the, uh, of the experience so that you could see yourselves uh, more as heroes than as cowards. And I think that right there is, is it. Um, you, you know, helped me see that, you know, my dad had issues of his own cowardice that certainly dogged him throughout his life mm -hmm. uh, from his seminal event that happened when he was 18, 19 mm -hmm. years old, um, when he ran away from a horde of invading Chinese during the, the Korean War and him thinking himself a coward when all he wanted to be growing up was a army man. Um, and in his moment of you know greatest trial, he ran away, but yet, you were able to help me see that, well, he didn't run away. He turned around and ran back and ran back up that hill and grabbed that machine gun so that it wouldn't fall into en enemy hands. Um, so he was in fact a hero, uh, mm -hmm. despite that maybe in his own mind, he was less than a man uh, for a better part of his life. And feeling like he was less than a man probably yeah. gave him the idea that he'd better be more of a man with you and really come down hard on his 17 year old son who was coming home late uh, so that he could teach you the lesson you needed to learn so you wouldn't become a coward like him. Mm. All of which was basically a, uh, a, a bullshit belief system that he had created for himself, a meaning of life, which in fact was a negative meaning and uh, had very little connection to what really happened. Mm. And, you know, as I look at the last years of his life, how much pain that he was in, because he had some physical ailments and things like that, and how he was trying to be brave uh, to soldier through, you know, the pain and how I would just give him some CBD, uh, mm -hmm. and how it would help alleviate the pain and how grateful he was just for that, but yet how he wouldn't take such a simple proactive measure to relieve that pain himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true that an awful lot of people who have come to see me over the years have felt like they deserved pain. Mm -hmm. Felt like uh, pain was some sort of uh, divine punishment uh, that, uh, uh, that came to them for some uh, uh, horrible construct they had formed of previous experiences. And uh, uh, it's very interesting because the reframing of the pain, uh, the reframing of the experiences 
uh, often helps people to see themselves in a different light and to accept that what there is is something that can be helped uh, by just looking at it differently, by just learning how to think about it differently. And, uh, I personally have uh, I've had a few uh, uh, very difficult uh, uh, experiences. Uh, it surprises me that I'm still alive at 77 because it looks to me like there are at least a dozen times when uh, most anybody else would have died in experiencing what I experienced. Wow. At the same time, uh, uh, I do believe in God partly because of this. Uh, uh, my God is someone who, who forgives, who understands, and who helps me to change how I think about things so that I can help others, and that helps me. Mm. Well, and what I thought was really interesting, I was just thinking about this as I was preparing for today's uh, podcast here. Um, it wasn't long after that you, know, you and I had had this sort of breakthrough uh, yeah with this about the realization of my father and how I was able to help heal him mm -hmm. that uh, if you recall, I had seen my father. Um, for those who are watching, um, just a few days after Neil and I had had one of our final sessions, I saw my father. Uh, it was at a distance, but it was for a good three seconds. He was driving in a car and I had to do a double take to just make sure that it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me, but I saw my father. And I, I as I look back in, the, in, in preparing for this, that was like sort of an aha for me. It's like, oh my God, I saw my dad. Not long after you and I had had our final session where we sort of kind of nutshelled this together that I was able to help heal him at the same time. And, and as I look back at that now, I, I see that as a wonderful confirmation from him uh, yeah. that he wanted to appear to me and to let me know that it's okay. And, and it, as a symbol, he was in a car and so that he's moving on. That yeah. maybe he's moving on to the next stage for him. Mm -hmm. um, and yes. that was sort of maybe our goodbye. Mm -hmm. Sure. And whether what you saw was real or a projection or a hallucination or whatever and other people want to project onto it. <clears throat> the truth is that it was the closure that was needed uh, to deal with really the only unresolved major issue in your life. Uh, and uh, you have spent most of your life thinking of yourself more as a loser and a coward than as a winner and a hero. And uh, by virtue of your having uh, been father to your father, by virtue of your having understood what happened to him and applied it to yourself and seen your contribution to his healing, uh, you are now, at least in my best fantasy, uh, uh, done with any uh, uh, past therapeutic process and ready to get on with your life as the winner that you are. Mm, wonderful. Not sure what uh, format that's gonna take. I can say that I'm in a, a really great place right now um, mm -hmm. where I am actualized uh, by uh, doing something 180 degrees different than I ever thought I would want to do, which I'm now doing locksmithing, mm -hmm. um, which is just something that five years ago never would have been in my realm of, you know, possibility or desire. Um, so here I am in 2022, um, excited about what uh, is coming next. And even if it's not anything next, to just actually be able to relax in the now. Yes. Um, I was just sitting here, you know, preparing for today's uh, podcast and just looking around and realizing how content I am with things that they are in the now and how I, I actually 
don't really want to change anything um, mm-hmm. because the now is really good. It's all there is. And I can testify to your confidence as a locksmith since you opened a, <laughs> uh, a file cabinet of mine right. that I couldn't open before. And uh, uh, the, the experience of the present is all there is, <clears throat> but it can only be truly appreciated when you have the now in its proper context, taking into account the past. <clears throat> when the past contributes to your existing in the now, without some sort of uh, self-talk of uh, how you screwed up in the past and, and uh, how you need to, uh, you don't deserve uh, to enjoy the comforts and the experience of now. Uh, we've talked about this before, but nobody gets out of life alive. The issue is how do you get through this moment in a way which you can say to yourself, I did the best I could. Mm. Uh, and if you feel in retrospect you didn't do as well as you could how can i change so that the next time something like this comes up i can feel i grew rather than shriveled and i think our work has really helped me uh be a little bit nicer to myself Mm. Uh, be willing to give myself a break and to not be so hard on myself that like you said, oh, I'm a loser. Or, oh, you're an idiot for doing that because that self-talk of course is what can keep you down. Um, and- this is the, uh, uh, this is the- Psychology Today, the forgive you. Uh, uh, that came out this month. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it's an extraordinarily important concept to be able to uh, forgive yourself, to be able to accept yourself as you are uh, it's taken me a long time. In fact, I tweeted today about the fact that uh, I see myself as an idiot savant. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm very good at knowing how people think and at changing that uh, thinking so they can uh, think in ways that are more constructive and positive for themselves. Uh, but if you ask me to figure out how to get this chair through that door, I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a thought engineer. I'm not an engineer that has to do with things. Uh, so. <laughs> The idiot part of me has been there my whole life. Uh, Fortunately, I think I've been able to develop the the thought engineer part of me to the point where I can help a lot of people. I love that uh, framing, thought engineer. Um, Mm -hmm. And to that end, you know, you're in my brain. And we've talked about that a lot, that uh, the self-talk I have now in my brain is actually talking to you. Um, Mm -hmm. And... I find that I'm pretty content. And one of the things that I say to myself a lot is that I'm doing the best I can with what I have. Good. And that's sort of my way to forgive myself if I don't, you know, do whatever uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, maybe I'm self-disappointing. No, I'm doing the best I can with what I have and it's going to be whatever it's going to be. And I'm okay with it because I'm okay with myself. You That's know? wonderful. And if you really look at in, in depth at any behavior, anything we do, uh, uh, it's a compromise. It's a compromise between forces which are pushing us towards doing something that would be worse and forcing that, uh, forces that are pushing us toward doing something that would be, in our minds, better. Hmm. Uh, and when you understand what those forces are, you can move yourself toward the better. Uh, I find that examining the, the negative forces, which we've done in these podcasts, I mean, they can't get much more negative force than a person who so seriously tries to kill himself than you did, uh, who wakes up really unhappy that he didn't succeed in killing himself, mm. really pissed off at himself because he didn't, and who has now turned into the person that you're presenting to the world right now. Uh, there's no better way to understand how Getting into the negative at sufficient depth uh, and with the proper help can help you to become more positive and uh, more of a of a person who understands life as it really is. And and you know that again is what I feel so great about the podcast series in a sense is that we have, particularly in the last several episodes, we've been trying to detail how your thoughts inform your perceptions which then dictate your reality so it's really important 
to be careful how you think of something and mm -hmm. to, you know, in my case, you know, not always dwell on the negative because you can always find it, but actually to really consciously look at the positive and to be in the now. And it's like, as I look around me, even just here now, I look at what I have surrounded myself with of shape and size and color and texture and composite, even just, you know, looking here behind you. Mm -hmm. So I see abundance now, wherever I look. Um, and that is what the world now is presenting to me mm -hmm. um, because I'm making that conscious decision to see this abundance and to yeah. train my mind to focus on the abundance rather than to uh, concentrate on a perceived lack, which isn't there. It only exists in my mind. Exactly. And what is and really it's here in front of me is a Pollyannish type of thing. It's not a, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to ignore the negative and just accentuate the positive. Uh, I remember uh, uh, a joke about a meeting in heaven between uh, uh, Norman Vincent Peale and Immanuel Kant. Norman Vincent Peale, the guy who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, and Immanuel Kant, the, uh, the great philosopher. And uh, uh, Immanuel Kant comes out in flowing black robes and holds out his hand and says, Immanuel Kant. And Norman Vincent Peale says, oh, yes, you can, Immanuel, just put your mind to it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, what a great way to end our series. Your final thoughts on our uh, podcast series here. Um, My final thought is uh, one of appreciation for you. Uh, uh, I have spent my entire uh, professional life uh, uh, with audiences of one or maybe two or three a family, and, uh, and everything that I do is uh, only available to the audience I'm talking to. Uh, what people say about what happened is up to them. Mm. Uh, I'm not into bragging about, uh, about my competence, uh, except maybe in my tweets. Uh, the bottom line on it, though, is that uh, uh, you've given me an opportunity to demonstrate to the world uh, who I am and what I do. And uh, this allows me to, uh, to, in a sense, die happy, uh, mm. uh, even though, for all I know, I am healthy and I may live another 10 or 20 years. Reminder that if you are suffering or someone you know or love is suffering and needs help, invite them to call a suicide prevention hotline or even to reach out to Dr. Neil Marinello personally. He's available for your uh, introspection and to help you with any issues that you may feel you have. He's a life coach out of Woodstock, Vermont, and you can find him on Twitter at Coach Dr. Neil. On behalf of The Good Doctor, I'm Matt Kelly. We're both wishing you good mental health.